the carrier for all my Aircon uh, babies. All right, they're keeping you cool all day, every day. Call today, 647-COOL. That's 647-2665. Also brought to you by Cabo Enterprises and IT&E. It's 929. Let's head into the KUAM Zoo, uh, new Zoom room. We, uh, we have a uh, standing by Sergeant Paul Tapal, the Guam Police Department. Hi, Paul. Hey, off the day. Buenas, buenas and saludas, and uh, viva mes tomorrow. Viva! Well, um, <laughs> you know, I wanted to start off because there was uh, some, some tragic news this morning, mm. and if you could provide the latest update on the, the crash uh, in Barragata. Sure. So, um, you know, we are, we, we've just opened up the roads as, as we're speaking right now. Um, I just got the call from our traffic investigators uh, from the Highway Patrol Division. They've just, they've just opened the roads. So, um, first, you know, motorists that are there that are going to be traversing to there, there's going to be a lot of delays as, um, you know, people are going to be trying to get to and from. I know we, um, we, we anticipated the rush hour, uh, rush hour traffic. So, you know, please slow it down. Um, it, it'll eventually clear up as we slowly open up the lanes and uh, allow for traffic to traverse there. But um, shortly before 3.30 uh, a.m., our officers from the Central Precinct Command responded to a uh, two auto crash. And uh, as a result of that crash, one of the operators from the vehicle, I'm still, you know, we're still in the preliminary stage, so um, I'm only gonna give you the, the raw information that I have for now. Um, but I'll, I'll provide more as, as, as the day um, progresses. But one of the operators within the vehicle um, was transported to Naval Hospital Guam, where he later succumbed to his injuries. Now, um, we do know that the vehicles involved was a Nissan Versa and a Black Lexus. So um, getting the information right now, again, is gonna be a little bit, uh, may, may take some time as you know our, our investigators are heading back to section two uh, rehash what had occurred so as that comes up you know um, we'll provide it again but um, this is our fifth fatality for the year and again we're still in the month of march which is the you know if you look at the calendar it's our third month of the year so you know um this is you know a, a good indicator that um we're in a, a trend and we want to prevent that from happening but this is an open case um very very early in this investigation so We'll provide more as, as the day uh, progresses. Okay. The, the, you said it was a male uh, occupant or driver? Yes. Occup no, operator. Operator. No operator. One of the vehicles, yeah. Oh, you don't know which You don't know which vehicle? Which um, vehicle? I, don't, I don't have a, a complete synopsis to release at this time. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, once we get off, um, this was the delay again. Um, I know I was supposed to be on at 9 o'clock, and I had reached out to Chris. Then again, I was going to be late. So, you know, we're still getting information, and... Um, we had, you know, a lot of work to do with Naval Hospital and getting the information, of course, you know, uh, will be provided um, to our investigators as, you know, we move towards the day. Okay, so anybody traveling in the Barragata area, this is Route 8, the Purple uh, Heart Memorial Highway. The roads have been reopened. There was a traffic fatality. It occurred um, uh, around 3.30 this morning, two vehicles mm -hmm. were involved, a Nissan Versa and a black Lexus. Uh, once uh, Paul is able to get more information, of course, we will pass that along. But Paul, as you mentioned, this is the fifth fatal crash of the year. Yeah. Do you have any updates on the cause of fatal four, the motorcycle crash? That, we're, we're, we're still, um, you know, we, we still have to wait for a lot of stuff to come up from there. I know they did the field mapping, um, so it's really the speed calculation. And the one thing that we're waiting for, of course, is the autopsy and the toxicology uh, report coming from the chief medical examiner's office. So um, that's where we, you know, determine where we can find whether impairment was a factor in any of the crashes that occurred within the roadways, uh, the five crashes, or um, once we ca uh, calculate and, and put and piece every evidence that we gathered from the previous crashes um, to include the fatal fatality, the motorcycle crash, and um, the one in Weddingale, and the other two crashes that occurred in Route 16 and Route 10, the auto pedestrian crash. Uh, we'll be able to, you know, provide more information as the causation or if any citation or arrests are going to be made from uh, these crashes that occurred. Okay. 
But so far, no arrests or anything. Not in, in this time. No arrests or citations have been, have been issued um, as a result of the uh, fatalities that occurred. And no autopsies have been conducted on the previous crashes? Not at, not at this time. That's uh, quite a wait. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's always going to, you know, we're, we're still trying to work out um, with the CME's office and, you know, um, getting the, because of COVID, I know on a weekly weekend basis, we were able to get the, um, you know, a pathologist from Saipan, the neighboring islands to fly over on the weekend and uh, any criminal, we or, you know, um, forensics that we needed, we were able to, you know, reach out to the island was able to reach out to Hawaii. But, uh, you know, since COVID uh, travel restrictions have really uh, put a damper on uh, the time that we are allowed to, or which is afforded to do an autopsy on, on either a fatality or any other um, um, death investigation that the Guam Police Department is investigating. Mm -hmm. Any update on the Jerry's Kitchen uh, reopened? It, it it it's still ongoing. Um, I know. I know the chief had um, directed our traffic investigators from um, GPD Highway Patrol Division to, um, you know, do a follow-up investigation. So um, I met with them yesterday. We're still gathering some evidence uh, within the scene. Um, they're going over some surveillance footage and stuff, and uh, re-interviewing some individuals. So um, they've assured that once they've wrapped up their investigation, they'll be able to submit. The findings to the chief of police, Chief Stephen Ignacio, and uh, we'll move forward from there. But uh, as of right now, it's still ongoing. Are you able to say if, if any, and just checking in to speak with these officers, if uh, you've heard anything that differs from the initial investigation? Because I know during the oversight hearing, uh, the chief had said that it was really the public's uh, concern with this. The whole incident that prompted him to reopen the investigation but he also said that he didn't think that they would really find anything but that he did it to kind of appease uh public concerns and media concerns you know there's there's a lot of variables that came into play right but you know again um the synopsis the investigation in itself and you know seeing what the officers did at the time of the officer who authored the, the report you know i mean um as a former crash investigator you know i I, I didn't see any flaw, and again, this is my opinion. Um, you know, we did we did take the concerns of the community because of the variable that was in play, which was an off-duty officer that was listed as the occupant of the red jeep. So, you know, I mean, uh, the chief, in, in, in since taking office, he's been very transparent with the community, with the media, and of course, um, you know, holding true to his word about transparency and, of course, integrity, protecting the integrity of the Guam Police Department. He has issued, um, you know, the follow-up investigation to this. So the variables that come into play, you know, these are some of the things that the concerns of the community has brought, had brought forth. So, you know, again, um, these are things in which we're going to look at. Um, our traffic investigators are going to revisit um, some of the scenes, uh, some of the surveillance footage that we can obtain um, from the surrounding areas, the building in itself, and of course, um, the neighboring uh, establishment so that we can grasp a better picture. But you know, again, the, um, the work in itself from a patrol level, I mean, I I personally didn't see any flaw into that um, as the report was written. You said officers. I thought only one officer responded. Well, you know, we did have our CSI there um, to take photograph of the scene and everything. So, you know, that in, 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 incorporates uh, the officer were involved. But it was, uh, I'm talking about the author of the report, um, the preliminary officer for the investigation. Any citations uh, been issued? I know there's more, uh, you know, places that have been opened and citation for the crash. No, 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 no. I'm switching to COVID citations. Bars. Oh, citations for the opening. I I don't have any count that was uh that was you know that we had tallied since the opening and lifting of restrictions, uh, some of easing of the restrictions. So um, I do um, know that we provided to, um, but I believe the traffic clerks um, have provided information. And the last count that I saw was eight since the um, authority was granted to um, um, invest, um, enforcement, um, the enforcement site from 
Department of Public Health and Social Service as of any citations that were issued to any um, bars or taverns that had opened um, as, as a result of the lifting of the restrictions. I don't have any information. We do know that um, the military, um, both the Navy and the Air Force has authorized its personnel, um, you know, the, the soldiers to go ahead and uh, frequent the bars and the establishment. So I didn't get any reports um, over the weekend of anything strange or unusual happening uh, down in Tumon or the greater area um, where we know of military personnel frequenting the, um, the establishment. So um, nothing was reported of the anything out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to give GPD the opportunity um, to respond. We did interview Xavier Tatao's family uh, yesterday. Um, Adriana Catero uh, did the story and she interviewed, I believe it was a mom and the sister. And they had some very strong comments about this investigation um, into, you know, their relative's uh, fatal shooting and his wife's, um, she died. They called it a sloppy investigation. They said that the sequence of events that were outlined by the chief of police during the press conference were false that there was no revving back and forth of the, the vehicle. And so I wanted to see, you, they said, you know, it may be the end for you guys, but this is just the beginning for them. What is um, GPD's response? You know, again, um, as Chief Ignacio had mentioned during the press conference, um, anytime an officer, sworn officer within the ranks of the Guam Police Department has to deploy um, deadly force, you know, that's really, um, it's a lot of, there's a lot of things that surround that. And of course, you know, um, the lives that were lost as a result of this incident, we, you know, our, our sincere condolences goes out to the family, you know, I mean, um, understanding where we, the officers were at this situation, you know, the training, um, every officer that goes through the training in the use of force continuum to um, the use of firearms and of course self-defense and everything will, you know, through the course of what had happened and the investigation that led to it, both the criminally criminal side and um, the administrative side, you know, Chief Stephen Ignacio, he, you know, wanted to maintain the integrity of both the criminal investigation and the um, administrative uh, portion by uh, you know, reaching out to independent agencies that will not show any bias towards any investigation. Um, the Office of the Attorney General took the lead with the criminal aspect of the investigation and Chief Stephen Ignacio reached out to Director Ignacio Pareto from Guam Customs and Quarantine and reaching out for their internal affairs investigators to take the lead with the administrative portion of the, the findings. And as we released in the press conference, um, you know, our officers were were, found, were not found in any violation of um, um, our, our general orders or our standard operating procedures in, in relative to this incident. Um, again, this, this you know, it's, it's a tragedy that it happened. And, you know, understanding the position and the predicament that any law enforcement officer faced, any first response, any uh, law enforcement officer that it's faced with um, dealing with deploying deadly force, we things, um, you know, the, the question was asked, uh, one of the corresponding reporters had asked time sequence and everything to put a time step in that. Um, and unless you've been there to understand that things happen either, you know, in, in a rapid manner that the dynamics change, you know, we, based on our training, first and foremost, we have to go home to our family. Um, you know, we have to maintain the trust of the community that entrusted us with the uh, the authority to serve and protect, you know, life over property. Yeah. And it's it's really, like I said, you know, like Chief mentioned, the coming out of this, there's, there's you know, it really, you know, um, the life that's lost, you know, um, it, 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 we can't replace that. And, you know, two, it's really two life. Yeah, the officers. Yeah. I get, I get it, Sarge, but from the other side, right? Xavier Tatato and um, uh, the, the Vicky Ann, uh, 
they're never going to go home to their families. Those officers are. Uh, and I just think from the public standpoint, when you have a single officer who fires 31 shots, mm -hmm. it just raises a lot of questions, right? So I'm sure you can see that. We, 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 gave, we gave a vivid detail as to the events that happened. Um, you know, that's the transparency in which we wanted to, to really um, provide to the public and the community and understanding what the officers were going through too. Um, you know, we were, we've, we provided that information to the greater community, um, whether it's, you know, whether we see it, you know, it, we have to stop the threat. And that is where we, our training comes in. And that's where we as law enforcement officers you know, threat on threat, it really is a matter of us seizing and stopping the threat from um, escalating further. Um, it, 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 it's tragic, it's, 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 it saddens me to, you know, to see that many lives have, have been affected by this. Um, you know, with our side of the house, our side of the shop, you know, we've assured and we've worked closely with the officers that were involved by affording them the opportunity um, to seek, you know, um, clinical help, our, our peer support team from within the department, our, you know, our pastors within the department that assist us with crisis situations such as this, and of course, um, government agencies that um, our officers can adopt to, and understanding, you know, the um, the concerns that the family may have. You know, we, you know, when we um, did that press conference, we wanted to assure that we maintain transparency and we provided as much detail information as we could. And, you know, um, at the end of the day, it really is, um, you know, that that instant where we have to deploy um, deadly force or discharge deadly force. And, you know, it, it's not it's not something that we think of every day, but it's something that we've trained for um, going in um, as law enforcement officers is in the event, you know, we've, our training has prepared us for this. Um, you know, our countless um, opportunities to train to better ourselves so that we can protect, you know, uh, the lives that we, we've sworn to protect. And of course, more importantly, protect our fellow officers too. When did Vicky Ann pass away? I don't have that information. Um, you know, I was, um, again, you know, we, I was pretty much monitoring the, the effects of um, the investigation, both the criminal aspect and, of course, the administrative portion. But um, there wasn't a bit, you know, they didn't have the, the information to me as to the uh, time frame of when the uh, victim, the, the passenger of the, the vehicle had passed away. So, case closed, everything's done. Yeah. Um, our officers have been cleared, um, you know. Again, you know, this this is a tragic situation, you know. Mm -hmm. Lives were affected by this, you know, I know right. the family is, you know, again, our, our, our deepest condolences, you know, I mean, it's. Uh, the, the officer that shot the 31 um, shots, how long has he been with GPD? I, I don't have um, the information of his personal jacket, man. I mean, but I know you know all the officers. So is he like a, a recent hire, or is he a long veteran, veteran officer? I, I, I don't know. I don't know the information of his uh, employment, or you know, I I don't want to prematurely say something that you know whether he's the the years of service that he has. But you know, again, you know, we want to assure the community that the training has um, prepared us for any situation that comes forth. I mean, that's part of the training, and that's part of the. The risk associated with this job is the use and deployment of deadly force. But is there training with vehicles coming at you, Sarge? Because I thought in the press conference that the chief had said there, I mean, do you guys do that kind of training? Chris, when we deploy deadly force, it's that, in that instant, you know, I mean, we can talk about this again, um, but it's in, at that instant where you feel, you know, you downright feel that your life is, is, is is in danger. I mean, you have a 3,000 pound vehicle coming at you with intent. With, we don't even know the intent, but the intentions in itself, as what we disclosed during the press conference, numerous times ran the patrol vehicle that was situated in the front. And numerous times, one or two times, well, there's an indicator that, you know, what, you know, when you're faced with that situation, 
understanding what you have to do and what we have been trained for, uh, been training with and the use of deadly force, it really is, you know, um, at that instant, you know, you have to react and you have to assure that your decisions that you're going to make, it's going to be to save lives. And it's unfortunate that the, although, you know, uh, the purpose is to save life, that once we deploy deadly force, it's going to discharge deadly force, you know, lives, lives are going to be affected by it. So understanding the situation that our officers were faced with and understanding the, the reasoning behind, it's really, you know, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. we can't change anything, right. you know, I mean, it's, we can, we can only move forward. Right. And we can always better ourselves. We, you know, we've, um, you know, we've, we've provided the information to the community and, you know, in understanding that we wanted to maintain that transparency of trust with the community. All right, Paul, so, you, you know, yeah, you, you, and you're right, the chief did say that they were dealing with a 300 pound right. uh, weapon, no, the weapon being the <coughs> vehicle, right. right? And that's Chief ED's uh, side of the story. But I, I did want to ask about uh, to Tao Tao. Um, did the officers know uh, who they were dealing with? Um, did they know who he was? Did he have a criminal record? So, like, like what we had mentioned during the press conference, our officers were there um, based on a, uh, an investigation, a theft complaint of the cell phone, which the victim of the, of the, the property was able to ping or locate the, um, the cell phone within, the, the, within that area. And that cell phone was located, um, like Chief had mentioned, within the vehicle. When our officers got there, you know, we got to understand how you know, law enforcement works where we want to make sure that where we are and, you know, the people that, you know, the, the elements that we provide, they, you know, we confirmed that the vehicle that was within that property was uh, registered stolen at the time. So, you know, understanding the situation, I don't know whether they, uh, you know, there was a confirmation of anybody identifying anybody within the vehicle, but we were there specifically for a theft complaint. And things escalate or things develop as it was as the officers were there. All right. Well, well, thanks, Paul. Um, and I, I guess we'll reach back to yeah. you a little bit later about the uh, the yes. the crash that occurred this morning. But yeah, thank you, you know, thank you so I much mean, for for answering those questions. Our condolences, man, to the to the community and this, you know, or to the family and the relatives of you know um, Xavier Tafalta and of course his wife. Um, this, you know, we, we, we never asked for this. We, you know, we don't, but we do know that as law enforcement officer, we need to, you know, understand the risk associated once we deploy or discharge that force and, you know, lives, lives have changed, you know, because of this incident and, you know, our, our thoughts and prayers do go out to the family. Thanks, Sarge. Thanks, Paul. Okay. okay. Stay safe. Yeah, you know, what, uh, the family reached out to us last year, but because of Xavier's criminal history, they were really reluctant to come forward um, exactly because of that, is because they felt like, oh, if we, if we really make a lot of noise about this, you know, uh, Xavier's had his share of run-ins with the law, and mm -hmm. they just felt like uh, no one would really care about uh, the And that's what they told me, you know what I mean? And so I can see that side of it, right? I mean, it's so complicated. I just thing on its face any anybody out here who's thinking a single officer fired 31 shots it just sounds excessive right but then when you fold in what the chief had said about a 3,000 pound weapon uh, what sergeant to said about I mean responding to a stolen cell phone and then finding out that the people are driving a, sto a vehicle that's been reported stolen so maybe the officers in their mind are you know adding two and two together and getting you know 50 right because you don't know I mean Stolen vehicle, stolen phone. Could there be a stolen firearm? Yeah, it's just uh, tough all around. And uh, you know, I really, I really wish the family uh, the best under the circumstances. And I think that they should pursue any you know legal option that they have to pursue. Because I mean, on its face, would the AG really look?